everybody, this is Stuart with Wine on the Dime. I'm at, today I'm at Kerrville Hills Winery, and I'm going to be talking to John Rivenberg. He's the owner of Her Kerrville Hills, and he's doing some really cool stuff out here in terms of growing the wine community. So first of all, hi, John. How you doing? <laughs> Good, man. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, nice to see you, too. Let's go ahead and kick off a little bit. Uh, so when, when did you first get into wine, and sort of what was that whole experience that kind of kicked you into that realm? Um, I first got into wine in my 20s. Uh, long before most people uh, of my age group were, were drinking wines. In my early 20s, started drinking wine, was interested in it, uh, was producing a little wine just kind of on the side for hobby type situation, nothing, nothing for production value. Uh, and then I got into uh, commercial winemaking in uh, like 2007, 2008, uh, started to like look at uh, making wines um, here in Texas, and uh, the rest has been kind of history, man. It's real simple. There's not like some, uh, there's not some really great story about how I was uh, in France interning and decided I wanted to, you know, like quit my career and become a winemaker. Uh, it quite literally was, uh, you know, hey, do you want to make wine? Uh, yeah, let's make some wine. And uh, my former father-in-law and I started a winery. I mean, it was literally that basic. There <laughs> wasn't much much else to yep. it. Yeah. And that winery was Bending Branch. Bending Branch Winery. Bending yeah. Branch Winery. So it's mm -hmm. definitely a Texas Hill Country favorite for a lot of folks that I know when they're going out, either enjoying the wine or just want a nice, quiet place to get away, sometimes yeah. listen to some music, drink some good stuff. Yeah, they still do, they still do a good job. I think we built a really great foundation mm -hmm. for what they're doing there. And Yeah. So um, what do you think is unique about this specific area? And why did you decide to buy Kerrville Hills and kind of convert it into this co-op experience that you've been building? Um, I mean, the, the Hill Country, you know, I'm, I'm a multi-generation Texan, so the Hill Country is near and dear to my heart um, always, right? Um, I uh, thought that uh, agriculturally and kind of like spiritually we had something that no no other place in the world has right like um i'm a firm believer that we may be on the foundation of what 100 years from now may be the next like burgundy right and i didn't want to move to california and <laughs> i didn't want to move and i didn't want to move anywhere <laughs> else and so um you know getting into the wine business here it just kind of made sense right it was an it was an untapped um adventure right there there were some great people that had started doing this from a foundation standpoint. We had some great predecessors that had done a really good job kind of laying the foundation for the wine industry. And we felt like we could come in and uh, we could help raise the bar a little bit, right? Uh, me being a, a pseudo busybody, um, I, uh, I, I just, I delve into everything, right? Like I just, once I latch onto something, it's pretty much impossible to get me to kind of stop working at something. And so I've just been a huge proponent for the last decade, easily, uh, for the development of Texas grapes, development of Texas wines, development of viticulture and enology in our state. And I've been a firm believer in the fact that as we gained uh, education on how this industry works, not only from just from a, from a research standpoint, but from how the industry actually operates, that it would help you know, kind of raise the bar for what we're doing in our in our region, right? I, I've just been a, a firm believer in that. And so when I left Bending Branch, uh, I started a consulting firm. In that consulting firm, I've helped m numerous people get started, right? Um, planted some really large vineyards, started some really large operations, started some really small operations, had made some great friends and people that are basically like family now. Um, and uh, last year at this time, uh, the Millburgers, Wayne and Carol Millburger, who uh, started Kerbal mm -hmm. Hills Winery in 2008, uh, they approached me with uh, buying the winery and um, kind of taking over. They were ready to spend time with their grandkids and do, do something else and uh, kind of move into that next chapter of, of uh, their life. And, and quite honestly, they, they've, they've been so generous and kind of made me an offer I couldn't refuse. And um, so here we are, right? Um, the facility itself is great. Wayne built a really great winery. I mean, operating winery, we've got we've got things that wineries, uh, you know, that have bigger names don't have, right? 
Uh, we've got a 12,000 square foot facility. We've got almost 30,000 gallons in tank space and fermentation space. Yeah, that's a, quite impressive. There's a, lot of wine, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of quote unquote big wineries yeah. in the Hill Country that don't have that, right? And, um, and we've got this great tasting room and um, it's kind of been a hidden gem, right, if you will. And so doing what I've done for the last you know, 13 years, I saw the benefit, right? I saw the diamond that I had in front of me and the ability to um, take it, expand it, and grow. Um, and so I came up with the concept of bringing some of my um, my consulting clients uh, into the fold, necessarily whether they were at the standpoint of wanting to build a winery or not quite ready to build a winery or not quite at a place where they were ready to kind of branch off on their own. And we just created a common space for people to make, make wine, right? And so, um, you know, everybody's got their own licensing, their own permitting. Um, and we provide a, a space that has, uh, that has some winemaking experience, has some grape growing experience, um, has a fantastic place for people to come in and operate. Um, you just saw Mike Nelson in here. Yeah, y'all were talking about, like, should you oak it? Should, yeah, should what, you oak what, it? What should, should you not oak what, it? Which type of oak should you use? Yeah, and so we, we have a, you know, it's almost like, a, almost like an artist community, if you will. I wanted to create um, not just your common custom crush, right? Like, anybody can create a common custom crush where you yeah. can, you, Stuart, you can call me and say, John, I need a thousand cases of XYZ wines, and I can just put your wines together, send them back to you, and there you go. You've got them. You have no real interaction with what's yeah, happening with your exactly. wines, right? I wanted to create a space that had thought. I wanted people to be able to interact with different thought processes, different ideas, different, um, different mindsets of how wines should be produced or approached, um, both from a growing standpoint, from a, from a winemaking production standpoint, and I tell you, it's it's been a lot of fun, right? We've got a lot of creative people. We've got some young folks around here. We've got, you know, I, I, I kind of, excuse me, I kind of quote unquote play the ringleader role, um, but everybody gets to kind of, kind of, explore mm -hmm. their their creativity, right? With some with some training wheels around, yeah. right? Whether it's me or Haley, assistant winemaker. Or, uh, we've got another winemaker that makes wine here as well, Brock Estes, and so he's in from time to time. And uh, it, I just wanted to create a really cool space where we could work really hard in a fun way to elevate wine in Texas, continue to elevate wine like I've been trying to do for the last, you know, 10 years. Yeah, and, years. And, and that was something that uh, whenever I was looking into it, I was, I was very interested to see that there's – there's a handful of these things that are starting to pop up around the Texas Hill Country with the co-op groups, and um, and it's I'd like to ask that question because different different places have different sort of goals with what they're trying to accomplish for their co-ops. And <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> so so and and that's where when when we had initially been chatting, but before the cameras were rolling, I, I really got this. Um, this really good kind of feeling around the way that you wanted to almost have this almost be more of like an interactive classroom. Yeah, than, that's, a, that's a great way to put than it. Than really any. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, interactive classroom. Yeah. That's, so I mean, I mean, and you, it's it's almost sort of like um, back to like when you're in college and you're doing chemistry, right? Like you have the the person who's running the lab just kind of overseeing, but everybody's kind of doing their experiments yeah. and the, the, the pass fail and you're kind of like, well, this is kind of what was going on with this and yes, hey, let me give you some is, advice before you mix these things and blow us up. That's ex that's, a, that's, a, that's a perfect, that's a perfect analogy. Yeah, that's exactly what we're trying. <laughs> I mean, I, I literally like, you just feel free to use it. If you I, want to use it. I'm going to, don't you worry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will take it. Use it yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, no, and I mean, I think there's, there's been lots of concepts, you know, and I, I mean, uh, not to, I've been involved with a lot of stuff, right? I've been doing a lot of things for a long time. And there's a lot of concepts and things that are out there that, like, I was either on the ground floor of or part of. And some of the initial, like, I mean, Texas Fine Wines. Uh, myself, Frieder Kosterberg, David Culkin, um, Dr. Brennan, Bob Young. We, we were all kind of, Dr. Dickman and, and Dave Riley, we were all, like, kind of on the forefront of putting that Texas Fine Wines together because at the time, um, there was no, there was nobody doing any real marketing of Texas wines, right? Um, and, and so, 
you're, you're stronger like this, right, than you are like this. And so the concept behind that was to create a group of people to market Texas wines together. I think that's a great. I think that's that's great. I think they've done a fantastic job. Denise has done done amazing things with that group, right? Um, I wanted to take some of those early inputs that I had in developing that group, right, uh, or, or helping to in a small way develop that group, and helping like I have in other um, groups of folks who are either growing grapes together or making wine together, and and I kind of wanted to bring them all together. And and again, like you said, that interactive that interactive classroom, right? Um, we are trying to keep it a pretty exclusive group, right? We're not, we're not out. This is not a way for us to go out and like have a big custom crush or bring lots of people in. We, we really want to keep it on a much smaller scale, right? Than anybody else, uh, more based around quality and education, uh, and, uh, and an intellectual, but fun and not um, overbearing approach mm -hmm. to, to learning the process, right? Because everybody's got to learn the process. So it's nice to have a bunch of mentors all, all together kind of doing it. Yeah. So you, you'd mentioned that um, you, you spent a good chunk of time in, in the vines uh, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> in terms of growing and, and, and being selective about what you pick and how you... So are, are, are there any sort of, I guess, it, things that you would say are like methods that you really try to strictly adhere to whenever you're you're growing grapes or you're going through harvest are there any certain um like i even to the point where like i, I know one winemaker that has a ritual where like he has to like savor a champagne before he can pick because he doesn't feel like he'll have luck if <laughs> if it if, yeah. it's shav if it doesn't yeah. savor well then he's worried about his crop already and I mean that that's like baseball superstition, but yeah, uh, I, anything like I, that or <laughs> sorry, man. Uh, uh, I don't have any any any. I mean, weird superstitions like that. I have things that like come from, you know, you have you have research and then you have actual farmers, right? Mm -hmm. And I, uh, you know, I I have things like, even though it's more difficult to do your shoot thinning uh, towards the end of May as opposed to early May. Um, I've seen too many vineyards get whacked out by a 70 mile an hour thunderstorm that comes through the hill country, right? And I've had a vineyard completely devastated by hail in the first week of May, you know, uh, back in 2013. And so there's things that, there's things like from a, from a standpoint of like, they may not follow the quote unquote book prescription for viticulture, but they follow the prescription for where we're growing okay. grapes, right? So I have some things like that that I do. Um, I don't have any like crazy rituals where if I don't do this, the harvest is going to be uh, not great. Contrary to popular belief, I'm sure there are people out there that believe that I probably wear loincloth and bury cow horns and do all those kinds of crazy things. The biodynamic. The biodynamic. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, was, I was one of the first organic nerds in the state uh, long ago. Um, but uh, I, I, I don't. I, I do have one hard and fast rule is that there's not a hard and fast rule, right? And I work very diligently to, to, to watch and read and study and pay more closely attention to what's happening in front of me instead of what I feel like should be happening in front of me, right? Like, you can read in a book all day long that you're supposed to have this at this stage, this at this stage, this is it. It just doesn't happen like that here, right? Nobody's written, yeah. it, well, there has been a book written on Texas, right? But nobody's written a new book on Texas, right, on how things... Uh, uh, produce and navigate. And so I've always been a, a firm believer in that you kind of have to truly let your vineyard um, dictate what you're doing, not you try to 100% dictate mm -hmm. to the vineyard what it's doing, right? And I think you wind up with a better product in that regard, not getting hung up in rules, mm -hmm. right? So no, I mean, long-winded way around it is <laughs> I don't have like a hard, fast rule that says you have to do this or you have to do this or you have to do this. Now, I have practices that um, I try to employ that are tried and true from working in certain vineyards, right? Like there are certain vineyards that I know um, that if I pick a little earlier for acid, right, I know what I'm going to get from that fruit from that vineyard after making that fruit for 10 years out of that vineyard, right? Um, but as a rule, you know, it doesn't stay that way, right? Yeah. If the vineyard, if the vineyard shows me something different, we're going to let the vineyard continue to do what it's doing. I'm not going to like 
I'm not going to say, oh, well, this vineyard, such and such vineyard, we always, because of this Morved, we always pick it at uh, 22 brick and 3.3 pH because we want to get the acid. Well, one year we may be at 3.3 pH and see the brick actually like rising, right? And we may let it hang. That, that year it may be doing something completely different viticulturally mm -hmm. than we thought or history has, has shown us, right? So again, there's no hard, fast rule, right? That's the only rule. Yeah. So what about now coming out of the, the vineyard and going into the tank? Are there any sort of things that you uh, like to feel are almost like kind of the way, like a signature that you put on the way you make wine? Or do you still kind of carry over that, like, I'm, I'm just going to play? Sort no of mindset whenever you're no, actually going no. in and, I, and it's funny making. it's funny those people that have known me like on a that know me like on a like on a on a personal level or I'm a pretty jovial guy like I joke if I'm I think I'm pretty funny some people think I'm funny but <laughs> I I don't I don't I wouldn't be given the moniker for most people that have known me as like super serious right but when it comes to harvest time it's like I've had people that have spent like a season with me and they get into harvest and they're like, oh, shit, like where did this guy come from? Because I'm, I'm like meticulously anal about the process mm -hmm. and what we do, right? And not necessarily to rigidity where we have to do the same thing every time, but there are certain things that you just, this is just how things go. I'm, I'm rigid about we don't drink while we're making wine. I don't drink finished wine at all during harvest. That's probably one ritual that I have. I tune my palate to fermentation. I don't tune my palate to finish wine. I think it wrecks the process, right? Yeah. And so that's something that other winemakers, I think, in the state have kind of adapted from time to time just to see. And it, it's kind of cool how it works. Um, but I, I am uh, very much a, uh, you gotta balance the science and the manipulation with the art, right? And if you, you can very quickly with the wine I'm not a tinker or winemaker. I'm not going to sit and tinker and manipulate to justify my title as winemaker, right? Sometimes a fruit just comes in, you put it in a tank, and it ferments. <laughs> and you pump it over like you're supposed to, and the wine's great. And you don't need to sit there and like continue to manipulate, continue to tinker, continue to ma manipulate. And so uh, I think that, you know, one of my hard, fast rules, again, is just, you know, do the process, do the process right, and then wait to see what comes from there before you over manipulate. So don't over manipulate, I guess is what I'm trying so, to say. So with, with that, knowing, knowing that you're, the way that you approach things in the field and in the tank, has there been a varietal that you have used or worked with Either, either growing it or making wine out of it, that's just been a pain in the ass to deal with. <laughs> um, <laughs> because every, <laughs> every varietal I've worked with at some point is a pain in the ass. Whether, whether, <laughs> whether what stage it is that that pain in the ass uh, presents itself. Um, uh, but I, I, I'll be honest with you, if a, if a varietal's a pain in the ass, I just don't do it, right? Unless somebody's going, it, well, we've got to work with this. I mean, I, I've had a lot of luck. I, I've had, I've been very blessed to work with a lot of vineyards and a lot of operations. And so I think like last count, I've worked with probably, I don't know, like 30 different varietals in the hill country or in, in the state period yeah. rather. And, um, you know, you, you find ones that you, you would want to make. You find ones that you wouldn't want to make. Um, and I don't know that there is one in particular that I would say is, is, is like a tried and true, always kind of a pain, right? Mm -hmm. I think it's, there's so many variables that go into it based on like weather and harvest time and how it's picked and how it's delivered and how long to sit in a truck and how long, you know, all the other gambit of, of variables that mm -hmm. go into the producing, um, uh, will do that. Now I can tell you, I've, there's some varietals that just like, I guess probably because of experience and making them more than others that seem to just kind of like, they're like riding a bike. A little, a little bit easier. You, yeah, just, they're, just, they're, they're, they're just, just a little bit more routine. Yeah, than... I mean, I mean, it's no joke it's or, or secret that I've made a lot of Tanat, right? And I think Tanat is one of those ones that just kind of like, 
you know, I think at this point, I've kind of gotten down what I want to do, right? That I don't vary much from the recipe. Mm -hmm. It's very low impact. There's some extraction techniques we do. Um, you know, the, the recipe has been honed over, over some time and uh, I, I think that's where it is. So mm -hmm. that, it's nice, it comes in, I know where it's gonna be, I know what I need to do, I know what it's gonna end up like if I do this recipe, so that makes it easy, right? Um, it's, the, it's the new ones, anytime you do something new that's an that's un unknown, right? Like, um, in 2018 I made my first uh, a Sangiovese, right? And so, you know, did some research, wine was smoking, it was awesome, right? But it freaked me out, like, for whatever reason, uh, and we've made it every year since, something I learned in like the first, like initial or end of the first lag phase, it smells like pepperoni <laughs> or like a sausage, right? The first time I made it, I was like, oh man, I messed this mm, up. Like new. I did something horribly wrong. <laughs> but it was, you know, after nine years of making wine, I just didn't realize that's what that varietal smelled like at well, that and stage because I had made that wine yeah, before. Yeah, and that goes back to what you said about not drinking finished wine during the winemaking process right. because if, if you're drinking a Sangio, like a high plain Sangio that is totally finished, been in the bottle for a year, yep. it, when, whenever you're going to something that's mid-barrel mid yeah. or mid-tank. Mid or even mid-fermentation. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like you're, you're going to have a totally different experience with what 100%. you're tasting. And it, it's funny because... Um, uh, I was at a, a barrel tasting and someone tasted out uh, some of the Merlot and they were like, this doesn't taste like Merlot at all. And I'm like, it, it literally was just put in the barrel like two days ago. What are you expecting it to taste like? Like, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's basically just finished wine that hasn't had right. any chance to, to pull in any of that oak flavor that and you're that's, looking for yet. And that's that, and that's that, um, that's the not, that's the novice approach or the novice uh, uneducated um, conversation, right? Which is why I try very hard to explain to people. Like, when we taste and we taste out of the barrel, I try to explain to them every step of where we're at, mm -hmm. right? And that what they're going to taste is not going to ever, nine times out of ten, ever going to taste like what hits their bottle in 16, 18, 24 months, mm -hmm. right? And so I think when you do that, you start to, you know, create a more educated palate yeah. uh, and the next time they go somewhere else they go oh this tastes like the Merlot that was from the last place that was only in the barrel for two months or three months and you start to build that that education mm -hmm. base right which is like we talked about earlier that education base is a little different between like a psalm versus a producer yes yeah right you know yeah. what I mean like I, hats off to these to these men and women that can like taste through varietals and pick vintages and years and everything or, else or sometimes even specific chateaus Ex that is from exactly. it's like yeah. Okay, that's nuts. But at the same time, I've sat down with them and they can't tell a damn thing about what it is <laughs> when it's like at the second lag phase or just post fermentation or just pre press or post press. Like, you know, and I, and I love when they go like, oh, is this is this is this free run or is this like fraction press? And I'm like, it, it's neither. You know, <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's neither. Um, and so it, it's that it's that education base, right? Um, and, and I think it's just it's wildly interesting to see and to educate the difference between those two schools of art, mm -hmm. right? The production art and the 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 finished and um, I don't know how you would call it the like the heightened experience education, mm -hmm. right? That Psalms bring, right? Because yeah. I, I just can't do it, right? Yeah. I can talk about making wine and how we bring it in and well, and, 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 and um, on my channel, I've done sort of like a vlog series of what it was like going through the W set stuff, mm -hmm. and um, and I even had a video of like what can you do in the industry once you get these types of certifications, and and I specifically state that these aren't like this is not a song, like if you're if you're looking for service, if you're looking for that that type of, of career then you probably need to be going through the master court mm -hmm. and not doing this but but that's where where it's good to sort of have like those two tracks of knowledge right you have mm -hmm. you have what what do i do with the finished product once i receive it and how like how do i like like really kind of elevate that experience and make sure it works with my situation versus 
like like from from vine to bottle yeah. how, how do you go through and and make all of that great as well and so there's sort of different tracks there and um i like the fact that that you're here educating on one track because i think there are a lot of people who focus too much on the other track because they make movies about that they yeah. don't make movies about what you do yeah it's funny <laughs> it, it's, it, it's 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 i always laugh like like so what we do i mean people expect always expect winemakers to be um like the preconceived notion of what a winemaker is has always baffled me, right? And early on in my career, I had a great mentor, and he said, you know, he's like, if you ever want to know who the winemaker is in a room when you go to a wine dinner or a tasting or a big group function, he said, you know, look for, look, look for the, the guy in an ill-fitted sport coat in the corner drinking scotch. That's most likely, <laughs> that's most likely the winemaker. He's sick of drinking wine all day. <laughs> and, 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 and it's very true, you know? And it's, I mean, you know, you find yourself like, it, it's, just, it's just such a different paradigm to the sales and front of the house part, you know, what, what the world thinks. I've worked very hard to like strip away the veil of what people think winemakers in the wine industry are. At the end of the day, winemakers are they're farmers. They're 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 wearing dirty jeans and dusty boots, and and they are uh, you know generally working their tail off, right? And so not not to say that the the front of the house isn't. It's just different, it's, right? Yeah, it's, and it's, it's different just, roles. And it's yeah. just different roles. And even though they they want to kind of glamorize the winemaker, it's not. Like, it's just not glamorous, it's right? It's part of why they don't make movies on it's it. It's probably, yeah, <laughs> they, yeah, they don't. Um, and, and if they do, they, they make us taller and better hair. Uh, but, uh, but the, 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 you know, the point being is just that, like, it's, it's been a mission of mine to educate people to, for lack of a better, now, like, how the sausage is made. Yeah. You know, and a lot of people, they find it pretty cool when they find out like, you know, oh, wow, like we don't have to be so pretentious when we go drink wine. Like wine isn't a pretentious thing. Like wine is an agricultural product made in this, you know, made in this way. Um, you know, you, you, you don't have to put this highbrow version that the United States in the last 30 years has put on it. Right. It, you can just enjoy it. Yeah. You, you know, if you just you like something just drink it you know that's kind of always been my my mentality right like they always joke with me i i am a i'm a girl drink drunk I, if it's got an umbrella and it's fruity and it's like i love it you know what i mean like i you know i, I love my pina coladas i can't help it you know but people always go like well you're a winemaker you're not supposed to be drinking pina coladas like well why you know like, why yeah. where's the, i didn't see the, in the rule book when i signed up is that not in the job description or <laughs> you know i I thought we were allowed to do whatever we wanted, but yeah, but I, I digress. But. Okay, so um, let's go ahead. We've, we've had a chance to kind of talk about some of how to make the wine and, mm -hmm. and the way that you've uh, uh, kind of built this place, but let's actually talk about some of this wine. So okay. I think we have the Tanat in our glass, right? We do, yeah. This is a, this is a brand new release. You have the Tanat. Yeah, yeah, I, you. I've uh, been consuming, yeah. <laughs> that's fine, that's uh, fine. I am, uh, you know, they as I was deemed this last January by a friend who thought it was more of a, was more of a slap in the face. They, they called me the Johnny Appleseed of Tanat. Well, okay, I'll take it. You know, I mean, when I started- It's a nice grape. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people making it, yeah. you know. Uh, when we started, nobody was making it. Um, this particular uh, Tanat is from Rustic Spur Vineyards in Stonewall, Texas, grown by the Mills family. Um, they do a fantastic job with this varietal. It is just that vineyard is, I, I wish we had 30 more acres of this vineyard because it just produces fantastic tannin year after year after year after year. Tannin structure is amazing. It's grippy. Mm -hmm. It's got nice fruit. The acid is always so super balanced. And I, I think I would contribute that to, to the hard work and canopy management that the Mills family puts in this vineyard, right? I would say that this vineyard is probably touched more than any other vineyard uh, that I know of, at least in the hill country. I mean, they just, they are just constantly, every day going in and just making sure that the perfect balance of, of sunlight and air and, uh, you know, uh, nutrient is, is put in this vineyard. And it's just, it, it comes through in the fruit. Um, so 17, it's been in barrel, uh, neutral oak, 
All this tannin is in here is derived as fruit tannin. There's no, no oak in it. Um, we just bottled it about three weeks ago. Uh, I think it could probably use, I mean, if I had my way, it would sit in the bottle for a year before we released it, but the world being what it is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll, we will probably, we will probably uh, release this with some guidelines here in June on, you know, buy a couple bottles, drink one now, put a couple away, yep. you know, see, see where it's going. And, a and this is a wine, and, and we, we had kind of talked about it before too, but this is a wine where when you said it could last 10 years, I was 100% on board with you. Like this, is, this, has, this has really nice acidity, has a really great tannic structure to it. And so as it ages and mellows out a little bit more over time and continues to develop, it's just gonna become more complex, but that acidity is, it, I mean, I don't see it really going away. And, and for yeah, a long I, time. I would, like, I would agree. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very nice. I really like the fruit. And like you were saying with the tannins, I really like to not where I feel like as soon as I take a sip, I have to go brush my teeth before the next <laughs> sip. And, and that's, that's kind of what you get with this. And I, I, I really do like that because I think there, and, and even going a step further, I also like that you're using neutral oak on it because I think one of the things I've seen some winemakers here in Texas do is go really hard putting to not in new oak, especially like new American. And it makes it have this not to naughty taste. If no. that's it. Yeah, not, it's not a thing. Like, yeah, it, 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 so it, it, it allows you to really kind of focus on the grape and, and the qualities of the grape that it has versus yeah. say like, oh, it's Tanat with like a whole bunch of this vanilla and this weird kind of clove spice thing <laughs> that's going on with it and versus just actually getting the qualities of the grape itself. Yeah, I, I would, I 100% would agree. And I mean, I, I gotta say, this is probably in my top three Tanats that I've produced in the, God, I don't even know how many I've produced at this point in all the different places I've made Tanat. And I would say this is definitely in the top three that I've produced. Um, and as a rule, I think in Texas, I mean, my buddies and friends are probably gonna like send me hate mail, but I, I think we use way too much oak as a rule yeah. in Texas, right? Um, and I'm, I'm a firm believer that, you know, letting our fruit express stylistically what we can do with our wines here is is as important as what the oak dynamic brings to the wine. It, it's important. Mm -hmm. I mean, I use a little bit of oak in a lot of things, but I will never do 100% oak in something. Like, I just won't. Yeah. Um, I think it just, it overpowers and completely hides. It's okay, come on. <laughs> So this is this is what happens in the operate in That's an operating this is what happens in operating winery. Um, we're we're labeling this as we speak. And Haley, come say hi, Haley. Haley, my assistant winemaker, is hi. bottling, and she wants to know if I like the height, and is it is it uh, is it running well? Looks great. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I and sometimes that's the reality behind wines. <laughs> is the bottling line running well? Is it going on like it's supposed to? It looks fantastic. And that, quite honestly, is the most truthful thing you could say in a winer. Um, but no, I, I just, uh, I, I'm kind of, I'm just so smitten with this wine. We opened up the first bottle like three or four days ago and I, I was just kind of floored. It's really good. I was kind of floored really with good. where it had come in just in, in like three weeks. And, it's been a while since I've produced a Tanat that's got, you know, I mean, this is, this is the Kerrville Hills Winery first, first release as a, as an, as a, you know, as a rebrand. Re and, uh, and so I'm excited. I'm excited that it's with the Mills family, with Rustic Spur and, uh, you know, coming from the Hill Country and it's pretty cool. We have a, a couple other things. We've got a Sagrantino from Nara Vineyard that'll be coming out. It's, I mean, it is equally as grippy, uh, I don't, you know, t Sagrantino, yeah, it's, it's super tannic super, as well. Yeah. A uh, lot more lush fruit, a little lighter body, but it's super grippy. Um, and then we have a, uh, a Newsome Tempranillo, which you and I tasted uh, earlier. That'll be coming out just behind that. Uh, and so, yeah, we're excited about, about all these wines. Yeah, so let's talk about the Tempranillo then. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just pour a little. <laughs> go right ahead, here. man. But yeah, so I mean, this one doesn't even have a label on it yet. No, like we literally just bottled this wine like, I don't know, two weeks ago. Maybe all at the same time. I think these all were bottled three weeks ago. 
the, the weeks have been kind of running together between homeschooling and projects and not knowing if it's Monday or Saturday or Friday or what day. So my wife's yeah. entire organization, when they when they check in every day, they're like, oh, what day is it? It's day day. It's day day. That's that's, and and it's gotten to the point where my wife has said it so much that it's driving me insane. But, <laughs> but the other day I, I went and I, I took the recycle bin out and uh, my wife was like, what were you doing outside? I was like, I, it's, it's Thursday. It's when the recycling goes out. And she was like, it's Thursday. I have a deadline. And like, <laughs> didn't even really. Just like, oh. And it's like, yeah, no. So I get it with, yeah, this, uh, having a global pandemic kind of really messes with your schedule. Yeah, a little bit. I mean, just a little bit. Yeah. So I, I, it's funny. Like, if it, wasn't, if it wasn't for Kelly, I would literally be like lost in space with what <laughs> I'd be doing. Because I would just zone out on one project and like what I'm doing. And I would, everything would just be like, you know, people would show up and be like, hey, we were supposed to talk today. Like, oh, really? Is it yeah. Tuesday? Okay, cool. All right. Well, give me five minutes to finish this and we'll talk. Yeah, it would be. I think um, the solution to that is day of the week underwear. Day of the week underwear. I think that way. Just keep That's it on track. That's a good idea. What day is it? It must be Can Friday. Look, it's Friday. <laughs> <laughs> it's Red Drawers Friday. There you go. So, um, yeah, but the, so going back to the Tempranillo, mm -hmm. um, what did you do whenever you were going through the process for this? Because... The, we had talked about how a lot of people can abuse to not. Yeah. And, it, and, and I, I see it mostly it. abused in the winemaking process. For Tempranillo in Texas, I see it mostly abused before it even gets to the facility to actually be pressed into wine. I yeah. see a lot of people go, doing it overripe, um, just letting it hang too long. And yeah. not kind of give us like what happened with this wine and because I think it's really good. Well, I mean, not to be contrarian to like some of the articles that just came out about like Tempranillo being the Texas grape and everybody, you know, I, I those who grow it, it's not their favorite grape. I can, I can promise you that. And some people will push back on that, but because they've hung their hat on Tempranillo and, and rightfully so, because it makes really nice Tempranillos. But from a growing standpoint, it's one of the more difficult grapes to grow in, in the state. Um, and so uh, I think that there's a handful of people that either their, their location um, or their due diligence in you know, maintaining and taming this, this grape um, has proven to produce nice fruit. Neil Newsom, I, I can tell you he's not real happy with his Tempranillo right now because of the, the amount of winter damage that this mm -hmm. fruit happens all the time. It was bad this year. It was, it was really bad. We were there uh, two weeks ago, uh, and it was it, it was shocking, to be honest with you, where, where the Tempranillo was at. And I know there's a block that he just pulled out that has traditionally not done, done well um, since it was planted. That being said, the stuff that does grow and the stuff that does produce, it produces absolutely amazing Tempranillo over and over and over again. I, and I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's the clone, but the density and lushness that comes out of that vineyard year after year after year, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of amazing to me. Right. And, um, so I, I would love to say that there's like some super great secret that I do to this wine whenever it comes in. But quite honestly, I'll tell you, I mean, this is a, <laughs> This wine comes in, it's been fermented. We use uh, GoFirm, which is a basic nutrient for yeast, yeast hydration starting. Uh, we use T73, we feed it at one third depletion, we feed it at two thirds depletion, we start ML at five brick. Uh, we use a pretty basic ML, it's an alpha uh, uh, malic bacteria, and we finish it to dry. We press it as hard as we possibly can uh, which a lot of people don't necessarily do, but I think that's a lot of that grittiness that mm -hmm. we get in the, that you get in this wine comes from that that hard astringent pressing. Yeah. I think that balances the structure of the fruit that Neil's place develops. Uh, and then we do two rackings uh, in tank, put it into barrel, and we, you know, every quarter we go and we top it and we SO to it. And that's it. Like, there's no like magic recipe or anything that we do to this wine. It's, it's interesting that you do such a hard press because so many people say don't hard press, don't over press your red wine because you're going to pull out too much tannin, you're going to over extract it, you're going to push out oils from the seed, things like that. Yeah. But even with you talking about how like it's a hard press, you can't tell. No. Like, I, I mean, I mean, I would if I would if you told me that this was an above average press on this a red wine. This is pressed over two bars. Like, which is like 
super, which is like, yeah, that's we hard. squeeze the shit out yeah. of it. Yeah, it's like really, really hard. And so I think, man, I, and I don't mean to like, I think so many people are hung up on either rumor mill, what they hear, or what they hear from something that uh, that somebody has written or some yeah. other person has said, you know. Um, the wine spectator, the wine spectator article this month. Uh, whatever it is, yeah. right? Or the guy down the road who, you know, thinks he knows something because he heard it from somebody else, right? No pun intended, but the grapevine. <laughs> and I think a lot of it is is kind of is kind of bullshit, right? Like you should figure out what works for your fruit and what you're doing. And you know what? If your if your wine is lacking in some of that tannin structure going into the press, why not push a little harder and get a little seed tannin out of it? Why not? What's it gonna hurt? No. Nothing. It's gonna it's gonna it's gonna mellow out in the in the barrel, right? And you, if you watch and you pay attention, right, you can either fraction that out, or you can work with some free run and blend back on some hard press fraction, or you can just like watch a vineyard and just know over time what it's gonna do when you press press the living life out of it, right? Um, and so. So that's that's what I do. I, I just don't conform to what like one of my buddies down the road told me. I'm going to conform to what I see in front of me, mm -hmm. right? And I've messed wines up by listening to other people go, oh, "You can't you can't press such and such that hard." Well, we left a lot on the table when we didn't press something that hard. And I mean, then you go into also the concept of who are you making the wine for and for the purpose, right? Like, yeah. are you making it as something that you expect people to drink within one to two years, or are you making this for something that will be cellared for a while? Right. And and maybe having some of that addition, like tannins, like that, if, if you have like a crazy, crazy screaming tannin wine, and you're expecting people to open it up within three months of buying it and enjoy it, that's it unless, they're, unless that's the type of wine those people like, right. your average person's not gonna like it. No. But if you if you put that in there and with the guidance, hey, in ten years this is going to be amazing. Mm -hmm. In five years it's still going to be awesome. Like, like that's the type of kind of also thought you have to have whenever you're making the wine. Right. And and, and just figure out who is who is this for. And right. When and, are they going to have it? And our concepts of what our vineyards give us is going to be vastly different than anywhere else in the world. Right. So that that education that says you shouldn't press a wine that hard comes from a place where, you know what, when I was making wine in California, if we did press like a Petite Syrah really, really hard, well, we blew the structure all apart because it got way too stringent, way too yeah. fast. Well, guess what? We don't produce the same type of fruit here. Yeah, right. exactly. So, well, it, you mean it, like there's a difference in geography and uh, I mean, climate and all these other things that go on? And yeah, <laughs> and I mean, believe it or not, bricks is not the only thing that you should actually measure when you're going to pick your fruit. That's yeah. blasphemy. <laughs> I know it's blasphemy, trust me. <laughs> I, I was laughed out of rooms until they started calling me Mr. Rivenberg. Here's your microphone. We were speaking today, and so I, I mean, it's it's one of those things, and it's it's a basic, dude. Like I'm not like it's literally like super basic concepts, right? Like if you take something and it, if it works in this region, great. That's a baseline of knowledge you should know, right? If you go two thousand miles away and something is structurally different. Why would you try and take and make it exactly the same as, as something that's different, right? So we have different phenolic compounds. We have different tannin compounds. Like, we don't develop the same fruit that they do in Northern California, Southern California, Oregon, Washington. We just don't, right? So until we started in the last eight years really focusing on what we need to do to produce our wines, right? We were we were we were just doing ourselves a disservice, right? Like the consultants from California, like, oh well, you can't press anything over one bar because it'll get way too astringent, and then we wouldn't press anything over one bar, and then our wines wines yeah. were weak, yeah. and people were like, well, why are the wines weak? And it just took one guy going or one girl going, well, why don't we just run it up to 1.8 bar and see what the hell happens? Or accidentally, it's like the chocolate and the peanut butter, yes. right? Like, <laughs> I, and I'm not gonna lie, like. One of my first like wheels off on my own winemaking, um, I pressed a I pressed a wine, way too hard, way too long, and it was like a happy accident. It was like oh crap, wow! Like six months in the barrel it was like, man, the structure on this wine is crazy in comparison to all the other wines. Going back looking at my records, the only thing that was different was our pressing, mm -hmm. right? There was literally nothing different from the other wines, so I started playing with fracturing and 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 you know 
free run, one bar, 1 1.5, excuse me, two bar pressings, and then, you know, kind of putting those back together. And then over time, you just learn, well, shit, this vineyard with this tempranillo, we need to press it over 1.5 because it's going to give us the structure that we want. And it may be a little thin under. That's, you know, so that's how those things derive. All right, so now I want to um, kind of change topics a little bit in terms of what we're discussing. Um, what did you want to be when you grew up as a kid? Oh, Jesus. Um, what did I want to be when I grew up? <laughs> I mean, I've everyone always, knows exactly what they want to be. I've always up, kind right? of been a little adult, dude, to be honest with you. Like, so I was, <laughs> I've always kind of had to be the grown up, uh, which is probably why I'm such a jovial goofball now, is because I've spent most. Huh? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to race dirt bikes. Um, let's see. Shit, I just wanted to be. I wanted to. I wanted to kind of. You weren't expecting this, were you? No, man, I wasn't. This is a good one. Nobody's ever asked me this one. What did I want to be when I grew up? I mean, you know, the best at everything, you know, uh, which is probably what most people would expect me to say. Uh, no, I mean, like, I, I wanted to, I wanted to, like, I wanted to race motocross. I wanted to be, you know, at one point in time, I wanted to be, like, an athlete. I, know, I mean, um, you know, I, I've had always had this crazy thirst for, like, knowledge and experiences, I, I've probably lived the lifetime of an 80-year-old man at this point in my life, right? So um, I've been, people always go like, how have you done all the things you've done? I was like, well, I just don't sit still, right? Like, there's just no idle time. Um, but I don't know. I bet at one point in time in my life, I probably wanted to be like a working cowboy or something. I think probably, um, you know, I've always been so driven towards, um, like, just being just being stable right like i was basically raised by a band of wolves that were managed by gypsies and so like <laughs> as, i was like i just want to be stable right like that was like i just want to have something stable in my life i don't care what the hell it is but I, I don't know like there i don't know that there's ever been one uh like particular thing that i've ever wanted to be i can tell you that once i started making wine i've never wanted to be anything else so yeah I don't know. Maybe I just, in the back of my head, I always wanted to be uh, a winemaker. A winemaker. I just didn't know it. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I want to ask you another question here, and I'm, I'm, I'll show this on the screen, but I want to, I want to ask this: What is the secret to looking so sexy when you lay on wine barrels? <laughs> because I tried this, and it just does not work at oh, all. Oh man, you know it's all right, dude. A lot of people have tried. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I guess the secret to looking sexy laying on wine barrels is, I guess, looking sexy all the time. I don't oh. know. Uh, <laughs> oh, then I'm screwed. <laughs> God. Um, I'm surprised they even let me put my face on YouTube. I, I uh, shit, you know how long it took me to get up off those barrels? <laughs> no, <I'm> kidding. <laughs> um, yeah, man, that's just my person. I mean, th those that know me, that they know that's always the, the yin and the yang of me, right? Like, I'm, I'm super jovial. I, I'm, like, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. But I'm ultra ultra serious when it comes to like my my the daily things that I do, right? And so a lot of times, quite honestly, it's something that people that work with me have a really hard time understanding that I can go from like, haha, we're gonna make these funny videos to no, like it, yeah. Now tomorrow, this is X Y Z. Here's our list. We need to maintain this. This has got to get done. Da da da. So I, you know, it's an interesting yin and the yang. I didn't expect you to pull that picture of me laying all the barrels out either, but um, Kelly made me do it, so I'm not going to take credit for that one. That was Kelly. She's like, lay, lay across the barrels. Lay across the barrels. So um, one, of the, one of the things I talk about often whenever I'm talking to people who are kind of like nervous about getting into wine or they're, they're nervous about exploring out past kind of like the one or two bottles they know, mm -hmm. um, I have this concept that I talk to them about of like a gateway wine. And so that whole concept of like, oh, if you do marijuana, you're going to do like meth in two weeks because like, <laughs> it's a gateway drug. I can so, promise you that's not true. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, but in terms of gateway wine, was there a wine that you had? Because you had talked about you were drinking wine way before a lot of your buddies were. Mm -hmm. So was there a, a wine that you can remember that, that you were like, man, I really like wine because of this? And it was kind of something that got you into enjoying wine. Oh, jeez. I honestly would be embarrassed to tell you what, what that was, man. Um, 
I, the first one I distinctly remember like purchasing, right, on a regular basis. I told you earlier, like I, I was really like, this is post this, but I, I was really smitten with, with, with Dr. Dr. Becker's Barbera when he was making mm -hmm. it, you know, back in the early 2000s, or, or early 90s, or late, late 90s. And so, but before that, and around the time of being 21, I would buy black opal Cabernet, uh, two bottles for 10.99, shrunk wrapped together. <laughs> and I it, thought it, it would be 9.99 if they didn't include the shrink wrap. Yes, yeah. I thought it was <laughs> super fancy, uh, you know, because they. Oh, well, I'm getting two bottles and they're shrunk wrap. This is very fancy packaging. That, you know, and like now that I've been in the industry long enough to know, it's just like throw the extra bottle in. We got to get rid of this yeah. shit, you know. But I mean, I, I honestly like. I drink that wine. I was still drinking that wine when we started Bending Branch Winery. <laughs> uh, and quite honestly, when we started Bending Branch Winery, I didn't have any money, so like that's what I had to drink. <laughs> you know, like that's what we, I was like, oh, I still got to drink the you know the five ninety nine or the five dollar stuff. Um, but that was probably one of those wines that I mean, you know, all joking aside, at twenty two years old, you know, I was like, oh, this is a pretty good, this is this is pretty yeah. good, and it's you know and. Being in the, that age, it was like this is a nice, nice value. Um, I will say that like the wines that really kind of like were my aha. I was truth, but truth be told, I was already producing wines and uh, growing grapes before I had a wine that just like you know kind of knocked me off my socks. Mm -hmm. And my first experience, uh, it was like my third vintage. So it would have been like 2009, 2010. I had an Amarone. I had a friend mm. who had a, a really good job at the time, and he ordered an Amarone at a restaurant in San Antonio, and I was, I was hooked. I was like, we're building mats, straw mats. We're gonna start, you know, we're we're gonna, I like, we're making Amarone in Texas, and everybody's like, dude, pump the brakes, yeah. new guy, you know, like, pump the grape Texaroni. brakes. Texaroni, well, that just Texaroni. sounds like bad rice. So, so yeah, it does. There's yeah. no trolleys here. Yeah. Um, so, but we, but this year, this last year, we actually did an Amarone project with Sagrantino out in our vineyards, where we 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 forced we forced hung to the point of raisin uh, Sagrantino on three rows. And then we took three rows and we picked it early for acid and we actually fermented both same fermentation um, and then blended the two back together for to barrel. And it's, dude, it's, it's a close, I've never tasted, had the ability to taste uh, a young Amarone, right? So I don't know, but the lusciousness and the development of the fruit is right there. So yeah, that's probably, that's, that's pretty cool. yeah. Um, okay, so I'm going to do some quick word association here. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to say uh, I'm going to say the word. You say the first thing that comes to mind. You, you sure about this? Yes. No. <laughs> yes. This is fine. Texas. Good. Napa. Old. Style. My own. Guilty. Me. Punt. Never. Pet nat. <laughs> Paquette. Lenoir. No comment. <laughs> okay. So so that, that kind of that kind of wraps up all the questions I have. I do want to say though, I, I, I have a gift for you. So um, I think you'll enjoy it. If it's a William Chris hat, you're in No, it, no. it's Oh nice! <laughs> Get your your own variety pack of White Claw. I understand you uh, you do enjoy it. I do like the White Claw. <laughs> yeah, I'm a hard seltzer fan. Me and every other sorority girl in Texas <laughs> drink the hell out of this stuff. Yeah, you I always find something when you're tubing. Then, dude, this is awesome. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. That's awesome, man. So, do you, is, uh, before we we end this, is there anything that you want to uh, plug for for Kerrville Hills or Texas wine industry in general? Um, I mean, I would say if I had to plug for the Texas wine industry, I would say, um, you know, drink local, right? Drink often, drink what you like, right? And uh, don't fly to Napa, drive to the Hill Country. That's it. All right. Well, 
This has been Stuart with Wine on the Dime, interviewing John Rivenberg of Kerrville Hills Winery. If you like today's video, please like, subscribe, and comment. Uh, if you have any questions, shoot them over to me, and I'll get back to John, and we'll get them answered in the comment section. Anyway, I'll see you all again soon with another interview or wine review.